Zelda world. Check it out, man. This is the forest. This is the forest. And then we've got the dungeon. It's like an interactive light show here. You can actually round these fish up and collect them. Can you see that? That's just insane. <laughs> the water. Right the water. Too cool, too cool, man. Let's go on, let's head on. I'll show you something spooky. What do we got here? Oh, man. Where are we now, this? What's this? This is the dungeon. This is the dungeon. <laughs> Check it out, guys. Two more playable levels of Zelda. Absolutely, four all up. So two in here, two in the other room. So I reckon we should just chill here for a bit. So this, what's happening, man? Man, Zelda, it's like our biggest game. It's going to be the biggest game of the year, obviously. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, we put a lot into this booth because we just feel really, really passionately about it. I mean, we're all gamers at Nintendo, and this Brilliant. is really a gamer's Man, game. Man, this is it, hey? Yeah, this is it. This is it. Zelda's, you know, Link, he's grown up, he's adult. This is it. The graphics just look amazing. Badass Link, man. Badass. Yeah, absolutely. Cannot wait for this yeah, one. Yeah, no. Oh, oh hello. What's going on here? Hey, buddy. One of the new features of the game is obviously that Link can become a wolf. He can become a wolf. Oh, oh wolfy boy. Oh, and he's got attitude. Hey, what's up, buddy? What's up? Ooh. Got a bite. Ooh. Yeah. Hey, buddy. Hey. Oh, Ooh. Who's your buddy? Who's your buddy? Ooh. Man, that wolf's out to get us, hey? So whenever Link enters the Twilight Realm, he's basically forced into becoming a wolf. That's the wolf connection. It's time to talk about Kingdom Hearts 2. This is actually the third game in the series. Felice Wu of Square Enix is going to tell us a little bit about how it came to be. We're going to have a lot of new Disney worlds again. We have Pirates of the Caribbean as one of our worlds that was announced, and the Mulan world. So Mingna is going to play Mulan, as she did in the movie. James Woods is playing Hades in the Hercules world, and Haley Joel Osment is playing Sora again. And when's the release date? It's this winter, 2005. Our next stop on the Square Enix booth tour is Dragon Quest VIII. It's called Journey of the Cursed King. This is the first title in the series that we're releasing after the merger with Square and Enix. It's a huge cultural phenomenon in Japan. It's an office, so it has to come out on a weekend. Um, this title in Japan when it released was, it sold over 3 million copies. Another hot title is Radiata Stories. Why is Square Enix so excited about this title? This is a title that's developed by Triace, which is the same company who did Star Ocean. It's just got really, really beautiful graphics, and it has like a sense of humor about it. You, instead of just hitting things to open them up like boxes, you can like kick it. So you should kick everything that you see, and you can, you can get potions or treasure. Final stop on the booth tour. It's all about mobile gaming, and we're going to get to see some of Before Crisis actually on the cell phone. Yeah, this is part of Final Fantasy VII compilation. It's the second one, and it's six years before the first Final Fantasy VII. You get to play the Turks, which is which were the bad guys in the original story. Um, our company really wants to get into mobile gaming because it's because of the networking capabilities and being able to play against your friends and on the go. All right, I'm here with Kelly Chen, who is the associate producer for StarCraft Ghost. Kelly is the man to talk to if you want to know something about StarCraft Ghost. So, what is new? What's the bomb? What's going on with Ghost? Give me the scoop. Okay, so StarCraft Ghost, the single player, is centered around uh, the main character named Nova. And she's going to be part of this, uh, this Terran Dominion army. We'll also be introducing a multiplayer. What we're showing right now is we're composing mostly of Terran units, but we're definitely looking forward to like putting in Zerg and Protoss units so that everybody that was like playing the RTS back before will really kind of feel like at home, be that one guy just, just kicking ass and going through the game. We're going to be putting in like Deathmatch, Team Deathmatch, matches called like Capture the Base, Hunt, um, Onslaught, and presenting it in a multiplayer fashion. Now what's the status of the game? How close to done are you guys on this thing? We really were focusing on like additional like new content. If it requires us to actually go into the 2006, the first half of that year, in order to deliver a powerful game, that's what we're going to do. The ones that are going to be big on PlayStation 3, undoubtedly from what we've seen so far, and it's obviously, it's not the whole list, you haven't seen everything. 
Motorstorm, which you saw from Evolution Studios, which is we subcontractor, is going to be big. Kill Zone from Gorilla. We think that is going to be an uh, absolutely, to use your words, an awesome title. <laughs> um, the Namco people are developing very, very hard, and they tend to get the dev kits in Japan first. So they're going to come out with the great games. Square, Namco, Konami. You're going to see sports games, some soccer games, which are just going to be amazing. It's going to be look, look, like looking at the World Cup on TV when you see some of those games. The key to it is the match between cell computing. What is cell computing? It's like cyber computing. It's in mathematics, it's called floating point. How fast can you compute something? You've got to link that to a perfect graphics chip. That's the output. That's how it's going to look on the screen. What Kutaragi thinks he's found with PlayStation 3 is that perfect match. It's like the perfect storm, right? And that's what they think they have found. That's why in only two months they've been able to produce those demos. They have blown me away. I was very surprised with some of the stuff that you saw on Motorstorm and what was the other one? On, on Killzone. The Ducks is fine. I mean, it's okay, yeah, it's good for show, but uh, for people to be able to put those things together on Heavenly Sword as well is just amazing. You probably saw yesterday at the SCEI show, there were computer guys from PC development, Unreal. They had not seen PS3 kits before. They were PC developers. They took them under two months to put together something really, really phenomenal. Eventually, you're going to be able to interact PSP with PS3, which is also wireless. That's the exciting part of it. And that was, many people missed that in the announcement, and it was that PS3 and PSP are in fact quite compatible. Hi, my name is Tony Tomasi. I'm the Vice President of Technical Marketing for NVIDIA. We're here at E3 to talk to you about a, a number of really exciting things that we're doing. Of course, the thing that's for, probably foremost in everyone's mind is the PS3. So, of course, we announced the RSX technology with Sony a few days ago um, in their press conference. It's going to be an amazing technology. Frankly, the combination of the cell processor and the RSX graphics processor is going to bring a, a whole new level to games and technology. Two teraflops of floating point performance really is an amount of graphics computation power that's, that's unheard of. It's orders of magnitude more powerful than anything that we've seen ever before. More than 300 million transistors, 512 megabytes of render memory. It's going to be a phenomenal platform, so we're really excited to be participating with Sony on that. So the demo that you see behind me is actually a demo we put together for PS3. We call her Luna. She's a several hundred thousand polygons, and we're actually rendering several million polygons per second. The actual complexity that we're using for this demo uses several hundred pixel shader instructions per pixel. That's more than 10 times the complexity of any previous generation demo that we've ever done in real time. If you look at her, it's actually cinematic quality. In fact, the quality of the rendering that you see in Luna is comparable to some movies that were done just a couple years ago. Her skin does a, an accurate model of human skin, including blood maps, surface map, tone maps, subsurface scattering. Her hair is incredibly realistic and dynamic, there's a, a very complex physics model behind that. And if you look at her suit, not only does it have some really interesting specular properties to it, but as the light shines or the plasma beam goes, you actually get this high dynamic range of this glow behind it. These are these kinds of effects you're going to see in the next generation games on the PS3 with the technology we bring to bear with, with the RSX graphics processor. The PS3 is probably going to be the, the platform of the deck. We're really excited to be participating with Sony in that, and we can't wait to see what the developers are going to bring to bear with games coming starting next year. I'm Peter Moore. Welcome to E3. I'm the Corporate Vice President of Worldwide Marketing and Publishing for Xbox. Welcome to the first day of E3. As you can see here, we're having a tremendous time with Xbox 360. Uh, the show just started today. Uh, this is the introduction of the Xbox 360. Uh, we've been uh, obviously getting a lot of publicity since the MTV broadcast. Excited to finally be able to show the world the console and the wireless controllers and the great games here at E3. What's really cool about it, obviously, you've got a beautifully designed product. You have controllers that are perfectly wireless. But I think the coolest thing is that this Christmas holiday here in North America, Europe, Japan, you'll be playing high definition games that are gorgeous to look at, incredible to listen to. There's probably going to be 25 to 40 games before the end of the calendar year. And I think the next generation has started. And it starts with Xbox 360. So specifically, we, we've laid down a series of what we call essentials for a game to meet the criteria that fits Xbox 360. The game has to run at a minimum of 720p, the minimum bar for high definition. The game has to support 5.1 multi-channel sound, the minimum bar for surround sound as we call it today. 
the game must fill up these 16 by 9 aspect ratio televisions, these wide screens we're all buying. And for gamers, the game must support anti-aliasing so that the jaggies go away and we get these smooth, cinematic, lifelike experiences. So there's three games that I'm really excited about right now. Project Gotham Racing 3 from the boys of Bizarre Creations in Liverpool, my hometown. Excited about the way that they bring racing to life in the streets. Ferraris, Lamborghinis, 170 miles an hour through the streets of London, Tokyo or Rome. The second game I'm most excited about is Perfect Dark Zero. Perfect Dark Zero welcomes back Joanna Dark to video games. It's the sequel to Perfect Dark. It is a massively multiplayer online game. As many as 50 people can be playing in a single game experience. Uh, we absolutely love the character that is Joanna Dark. And of course, the gameplay will be incredibly infectious. Third game, Cameo, also from Rare. Beautiful fantasy style action adventure type game. It will have incredible worlds of vivid color. But most importantly, Really, really, really fun gameplay. Cameo is a princess who morphs into different characters. The boys at Rare have done a tremendous job in bringing the Xbox 360 hardware to life. On Ghost Recon 3, pretty much everything's new. Of course, the biggest thing is that we're going to be a launch title for Xbox 360. And you know what that translates to is, is a hugely forward in graphics, uh, effects, the visuals, the immersion that you're going to have in the game. The way you can manipulate your characters once you're within Ghost Recon Country is going to just knock your socks off. We're calling it a revolutionary, cataclysmic shift in military gaming. We're really happy that we got on board with Xbox 360 right away. Uh, some people might remember our crash demo from the Game Developers Conference from a year ago. This is an extension of this. You get to drive fast in 20 different awesome cars, 30 different weapons, really awesome environments that blow up as well as in any first-person shooter. So really, we think we're the Swiss Army knife of, of action games right now. What have you been able to do with the software using the new hardware of the Xbox 360 that you wouldn't have been able to do on previous consoles? Oh, this game would absolutely not be possible on current gen. That's because of our physics. We have a really, really sophisticated physics engine. It's our own technology, and it drives everything that happens in the game. Hi, my name is Ashley Chang. I'm a senior producer here at Bethesda Softworks. I've been working on Oblivion for the past three years. Back in 2002, after we finished Morrowind, we decided, you know what, we're going to go big and we're going to go big early. So we decided Oblivion would be for the next generation consoles. We had a good idea of what the 360 was going to be all about, so we specifically designed the game to take advantage of the next generation hardware. The, first, the entire first year was spent on just technology. Technology, technology, technology. One of our major goals for the game was a fully featured forest that's never been seen before in any RPG. And again, it's, it, had, it wasn't possible with previous generation technology. So we spent a year working on making a, just a vast forest full of grass, trees, foliage, rocks. We had programmers go to the geology lab at the University of Maryland to study how soil erodes, how rock erodes, how trees grow. So we basically wrote a program that simulated this erosion so that you could see realistic looking hills, valleys, fields, mountains. And the game, again, it's, it's one continuous world, so you can keep going straight out to the horizon. You can get on your horse, ride off into the forest, and just keep going. There are no loads. It's all streaming in. Uh, the game is extremely pixel shader heavy. Everything is either enhanced or created by pixel shaders in some way. There are normal maps, parallax maps, uh, gloss maps everywhere on every object in the game. Um, so that we can portray realistic lighting, realistic uh, shadows as well, soft shadows on everything. So it's a, it's a very beautiful game. Our main goal was to go for photorealism this time around. We wanted you to feel like you're in Lord of the Rings in a true fantasy setting with lush forests and shining swords. Our objects were, we have over 9,000 objects that are meticulously built, uh, handcrafted by artists, and they look absolutely gorgeous with all the different textures and maps on them. One of our major goals was also uh, redoing the AI as well. So we created, we created an AI system called Radiant AI. It allows us to give NPCs 24-7 schedules. We have over 1,000 NPCs in the game, so it's physically impossible for us to, to custom script each NPC by hand. So the system lets us give, and give each NPC their own specific goals, their own specific follow behavior. Uh, we just tell them you're going to sleep during this time, you'll eat during this time, and they determine how they do it. If they're hungry, they'll see if they have anything in their inventory, they'll maybe go out and buy it. If they have low, um, if they're untrustworthy, they'll go out and possibly steal it. Um, or they'll go out and they'll kill it. You know, they may, they may find a deer in the woods, they'll kill the deer and they'll eat it. Um, 
Sleeping is the same way. They'll look for a bedroll, they'll look for a bed, they'll take their clothes off, they'll go to sleep. When they wake up in the morning, they'll put their armor back on. Um, that's actually a nice transition to vampires, which have come back into the game from Morrowind. And, and one of the things that you can do is you can watch when people sleep so that you know when you can go in and feed on them. It's a really cool feature, actually. It's something that we didn't really anticipate uh, when we first designed the system, but, we, but, we just, but as we started implementing vampires, we realized, wow, that's a really cool thing you can do. Um, definitely, you know, it's a good time for thieves to watch shopkeepers when they go to bed, when they close shop. It's a good time to break in and steal stuff, uh, sell at defenses in the game, make a lot of money that way. We have over 300 dungeons in the game for you to explore. Um, we implemented a lot of physics-based traps, things that swing around and knock you over. Uh, it's really, really cool stuff, really fun stuff. Um, we also revamped our combat system as well. So we wanted to really give you that visceral feeling of knocking guys around, uh, swinging your sword around, using the force feedback on the controller to really, you know, really give you that feeling of, of being in combat, of melee combat, something that's not really been quite done before uh, for an RPG. With each successive Elder Scrolls game, uh, our, our main idea is always to reinvent the game, um, to, to go back to the core concepts that make an Elder Scrolls game exciting. It's the, the freeform exploration, the, just the ridiculous amount of detail in the world and the environments, all the stuff that you can pick up and move and manipulate, and, and, ex and the exploration as well. So um, you're going to find all that in Oblivion. It's all there for you to explore, but we also wanted you to get to the fun faster as well. So we implemented fast travel where you don't always have to constantly travel back and forth between different locations in the world. We have horses now that you can ride and travel there faster. Um, when we first created the forests, we realized that it's really easy to get lost in a forest. Um, so we implemented map markers that will appear on a compass in the corner and let you know, again, show me the fun, where's the fun, and get me to there as fast as you can. Um, so. For the fans of the series, however, you know you, you can completely ignore these uh, implementations that we've done in the interface to make the game a little easier for casual gamers. Um, you can go wherever you want, do whatever you want. Uh, the depth of the game is still there with alchemy, spell making, enchanting. All the magic systems are back. All the skills are back. The classes, um, you know, uh, we, we definitely wanted to have the depth there uh, for our hardcore fans. However, we you know we tweaked the interface. We've tweaked the quest a bit so they're more they're more character driven, more story driven. Again, for the casual audience who just want to get in, they want to have some fun, they want to, you know, hear a good story, experience a good story, and then move on. They're not there to live another life necessarily. Um, so the Elder Scrolls for Oblivion will be uh, available uh, this Christmas. Well Jack X is the latest edition of uh, the Jack and Jackson franchise which has sold over seven and a half million units worldwide. And uh, this time we're taking it online. It's a racing game, combat racing. There's uh, racing elements as well as head-to-head -head arena combat. It's really cool. We're going six players online at a time. You got split screen multiplayer. You can play two players split screen at home, online with your friends. Uh, we also have uh, compatibility with Baxter PSP this time. Well, you link them together with the USB cable and uh, you can unlock secrets in each, in each of the games. So you unlock uh, some uh, Daxter PSP uh, stuff in Jack X, you get new racers, you get new uh, cars, so you can get some special items that you couldn't get in Jack X alone. If you get this one, then you get them all in one. Because this covers Matrix, Reloaded, Revolutions, and more. It's got the expanded universe. Another thing that we're doing that we're trying to innovate on is the whole strike and blocking thing. So we don't have a block button in Matrix and uh, Path of Neo. We have a strike button, and like martial arts, your strikes are your blocks. And one thing that we really want to get in this game uh, that's really prominent in the movies is when they're going back and forth with Wing Chun and stuff like that. So in this game, let's say, uh, take an early level, like a training mission. You, have, you start out with a three hit combo. One, two, three. This guy comes at you with a two hit combo. You stand there and he goes, one, two, you take it, boom, boom. You go up to him, one, two, three, he's gonna throw a two hit block because he has a two hit combo in his system. So he goes, block, block, but then he's out of combos. Your third one, if you follow through, is gonna hit him. The prince has returned to the city of Babylon. He's expecting a hero's welcome, and he returns, he sees an army attacking the city, and he realizes it's anything but the royal treatment. He gets infected by the sands of time. And for the non-players, the sands of time, they just have to know that it's a magical sand that, that changes people and infects them and makes them evil. 
And as he becomes more and more infected, the Dark Prince, the second playable character that we're so happy with, becomes more and more powerful and has more and more influence over the Prince's choices. This game you will play um, a human, adventurer and King Kong himself. So that's a very big, big, big game. Basically what he's do doing is, is um, taking online gaming to another level for the console, uh, supporting 24 players online, uh, huge big levels, a lot of vehicles, a lot of weapons, we call them toys, so you kind of create your own kind of experience uh, on the battlefield. Uh, at the same time, we're, we're uh, for the first time really in Battlefield's history, we're taking you through a storyline, kind of a single player option. The game is coming along fantastic. Um, you know, we've got a really innovative control system. We've got a great living world that we're creating, and you know, most importantly, we're dealing with this great property. How long has it been in development? We've yeah. been working on this thing for a couple of years, and and it's really coming together. You know, we're going to be shipping in the fall, and uh, you know, the the excitement is amazing. You're going to be able to create your your own character. You're going to become the star within this Godfather space, and then by virtue of the things you do in the world and how you do it, you're going to earn respect, you're going to gain money for the family, you're going to gain territory for the family, and then ultimately you'll work your way up through the family ranks until you become the Godfather. We have a very innovative control system called the Black Hand Control System, and there's three dimensions to it. The first dimension is a context-sensitive analog fighting system, so very much like a boxing or a wrestling game. The second dimension is the pressure point targeting system, so you've got various pressure points on the body to shoot at the shoulders, to shoot at the arms, to shoot at the knees. You want to be as violent as you need to be in any given situation without being any more violent than you had to be. When you do that, that's when you're going to maximize the respect that you get in any situation. And then the third dimension is kind of a face-to-face -face system where you have the opportunity to extort, negotiate, and do those things that mobsters do. Well, I'm Tony Hawk. I'm here at E3 in 2005, and we are unveiling, well, we're, we're doing a pre-show of the uh, Tony Hawk's American Wasteland, so uh, you're getting a sneak preview right here on my shoulder, actually, one of the few. Um, it's basically, for us, it's a, it was a challenge because it's all one big level, it's all Los Angeles, so you know you can escape from, from the coast to East LA and Beverly Hills, and, um, and yeah, that way there's no wait times, you know, in loading different areas, and uh, we're on Xbox Live, finally, and, and this story is much more based in authentic skating in terms of there's like some superstars of the 70s and uh, and there's all kinds of new skating in it. This is more about you're being the star and so you're, you know you're still the star of the game and, and I don't want to say it's a role-playing game but you know it's, you're, you're taken through this journey and you have to meet the challenges to, to get to the next sections and uh, um, there, there's sort of a I can't give too much away, but, but basically there's a sort of Valhalla that you're trying to create <laughs> or uncover. We got the new uh, layback and, and burts, you know, where you put your hand down, you can combo in and out of those. And so I think that was one of the few missing pieces that we ever had was, you know, this whole 70s sort of surfy style. Call of Duty 2 Big Red 1 is a com completely new game, uh, totally original for the current generation consoles. PS2, Xbox, and Nintendo GameCube. For the first time in any Call of Duty game, we're going to be following the same player character and his squad all the way through from beginning to end. So we take the title, Big Red One comes from the U.S. 1st Infantry Division. These are the guys, when they sent the troops into war, they got there first. It wasn't a pleasant job, somebody's got to do it, and they go through great historic battles through North Africa, Italy, all of Western Europe. If you're familiar with Quake 2, it's a continuation of the Quake 2 storyline, except for, you know, way over the top with graphics. We're using a, an augmented version of the Doom 3 engine, and even in the middle of the game, you actually turn part into one of the aliens, but that, you know, that's the key to actually bringing them down because now you have the inside into their network and you can take them down from the inside. What we've got here is Ultimate Spider-Man. This is based on the Marvel comic book of the same title. This is an updating of Spider-Man for, you know, the 21st century. What we've got here is a Spider-Man that's still in high school. He's got all the same problems you had in high school. You play about half the game as Spider-Man and about half the game as Venom. So you're playing as the bad guy for a change. So we're here to talk about Mark Echo's Getting Up, which is a game, I take it, unlike any other that's ever been released. Why is that? That would be safe to say, mainly because you play as a graffiti artist. You are, you start off as a toy, which is the lowest level of graffiti artist, and you basically start off the game by beefing with a rival crew, 
and then eventually you end up uncovering a larger government conspiracy and you end up, your art becomes much more political and you end up sort of bringing down the corrupt government of New Radius by the end. How much of Mark Echo's personal life since he's, you know, tagged onto the game here, no pun intended, um, is, uh, is represented in the game itself? Um, Mark, you know, certainly Mark is the creative director for this game. This was his idea almost seven years ago. Mark was a graffiti artist, um, but I would say that's probably where the real life similarities end. You know, Mark's real goal with this, obviously he's been very involved in graffiti culture for a long time, and one of his real goals with this game is to teach people about the history of graffiti culture and the tools that graffiti artists use to get their message out. We, uh, when we had this idea, Capcom can't sit, approach us said we want to make a game about Nightmare. We said we can't do it without Tim. So we got Tim in, we gave him some storylines, and we said, hey, we got an idea for a sequel to the movie. So this is actually takes place a year after the end of the film. That's it. No more Mr. Nice Bones. The exciting element is really just this, this world that Tim Burton created. You're playing as Jack. You're talking with all the characters. There's like, there's like 40 characters in the film, good guys and bad guys they have in this game. If you're going to places you saw in the movie that you wanted to go into, but it's not just like playing a movie, it's playing a different story. You go other places. This is a brand new Fairy Q Revolution Party. Uh, this is the brand new sing and dance mode where you sing and dance at the same time. Uh, you're judged both on your singing and your dancing. This is going to be on Xbox, GameCube, and PS2 this, uh, this coming uh, Christmas. You can sing and dance as one person, or you can have two people, one person singing or one person dancing. We, we will have 50 songs on the game this year, uh, more than we've ever had before. Kick it! Konami's booth is definitely hopping. Right now we have entered Club Revolution. Bean Mania started out as an arcade game. It's an interactive DJ simulation game. So you're actually dropping the beats, spinning the tracks, and putting the whole song together all in real time. You've got a turntable that you can you can scratch up and down, and then here you've got what looks like a mini keyboard. Notes come down on the screen. You gotta hit the corresponding key here or scratch. Wiki, wiki, wiki. Konami is definitely the pioneer and the leader in music games. Uh, my name is Jim Brown. I'm lead level designer with Epic Games. Uh, here today talking about Unreal Tournament 2007. UT 2007, we're, we're really leveraging everything we've learned in the past about the Unreal Tournament franchise. Really gone back to the community, got a lot of support there, um, taken a lot of their suggestions to heart. We're on Unreal Engine 3, which supports a complete brand new next gen engine um, that has soft shadows, self-shadowing characters and weapons, a brand new particle system and physics system that we can just do incredible things that we've never been able to do before. And of course, um, better tools than we've ever had before for development that's going to make tools for mod users even better. Um, we have the, the, death, the classic game types, uh, Deathmatch, CTF, Onslaught Returning. We're also introducing a new game type that we're tentatively calling Conquest Mode, which is essentially a a large-scale battle um, that's going to take advantage of Unreal Engine 3's uh, seamless level capability so that you can have one battlefront that actually streams in real time to another level and the battle can kind of wage back and forth, wage back and forth, so you have these very large-scale, huge, drawn-out battles. And um, it's going to include some new items. We have uh, an entirely new class of vehicles um, in addition to the Axon vehicles that you saw in UT 2004. We have a new class that are all Necros vehicles that are going to be a little bit new, a little bit different, um, very different from the standard tank buggy sci-fi type items that we have from UT 2004. All the classic weapons are returning. We're doing a new twist on a few of them and there will be some new weapons included along with that. In addition with the new vehicles, each of the new vehicles will have new weapons that can do new and exciting things that we're not quite ready to talk about yet. Um, I decided to say that it will be very good. Very much enhancing the single player experience. Um, research that we've done so far has shown that actually less than 25% of the people who purchase the game play online. So we're really focusing on making the single player experience very, very in-depth and very rewarding. We know that the game is multiplayer focused and we actually want the single player experience to be very much like the multiplayer experience that you can have, only have it offline. We're really working on improving AI to include um, banter that goes back and forth between the bots so they can give very specific locations, they can give you their status updates. One of them can say, I am at the Victory, uh, Victory Square, I need air support, call in Raptors, we'll come in and, and do an air assault attack. 
one of the bots can tell you, I have the Redeemer. You can tell him through uh, voice over IP, through voice commands, you can tell the bots, take the Redeemer, shoot the sniper that's in the tower. He'll understand what you're saying and do it exactly as that. Um, the bots will also have individual personalities that we're really going to focus on and develop so that when they banter back and forth, you'll know exactly who each person is and how they're interacting and why they're doing the things that they're doing. My name is uh, Rasmus and uh, I'm the game director of uh, Hitman Blood Money, the new version of Hitman that has actually been underway for quite some time because we started the design of it before we actually started doing contracts and did the whole pre-design there. Um, and it's, it's a Hitman game with the very big multi-layered epic story introduced again. Um, basically the whole game is, is new, both from the graphics. So the graphics is a brand new render engine that is cross-platform and totally customized to each platform, which means that we didn't develop a, a game for high-end PC and just ported it to PS2 and not vice versa either. We actually built everything so that it fitted uh, the exact platform. If you, a short so the description of the storyline is that ICA, which is the contract agency that Hitman works for, and another big, very important agency are sort of um, competing, <laughs> nice, competing uh, against being the best uh, at, at this cloning thing. Hitman being the only perfect clone and, the, and very, very good at what he does, of course, makes him very interesting, and he gets caught up in the middle of this whole rivalizing. So basically, Hitman is, is being left at hit, at, alone at some point in the game, and that, that's the sort of lineup of the plot. Um, in terms of technicalities, the, everything is new. Like, we have new camera controls, which is independent now, and not the stick cam that we had before. We have um, uh, AI that is totally rewritten, which means that NPCs react to stuff that you drop. They react to dead bodies, move them from the scene bring items to their quarters, so you have to bring it back if you just drop it. But most importantly, actually, I think the biggest new feature is all the stuff that goes on around the, the game. The name is Blood Money, and that of course means that there is lots of money involved. Uh, you, you make money on each mission, and that money you can choose to spend on various things. One thing which is probably going to appeal to gadget people is that the five key weapons that, uh, that Hitman has, there are 60 weapons at all, but the five key weapons can be upgraded to sort of suit the, the, the way you play the game, which means if you have the very stealthy way of playing it, well, you upgrade maybe your sniper rifle. If you like going Rambo, or at least in maybe one playthrough of the game, you like going Rambo, you upgrade the shotgun, for example. Each of these weapons are going to have between 10 and 20 upgrades that is drastically going to affect how the, the weapons work. Another thing you can, you can spend your money on is actual intel. Uh, we, were, we were aware that beforehand some people had difficulties playing the game because it was kind of challenging with this whole world just going on and you had to sort of figure out and patch things together. So now you're able to, on top of, of, of course, choosing a difficulty that affects the whole AI thing, you're able to uh, buy intel on up, about the interesting stuff in the level. So if you want to, say, rig an accident, you know, you want to drop this chandelier on someone because it's cool to do and you're just, you know, having a difficult time how to figure it out, you can buy these little patches of info that will all bind to the profile of the game. So it means you can't just do that and then load and you'll have the info. So it's going to have a consequence. Another cool thing is um, a notoriety system that we've introduced, which means that when you leave behind evidence, if you're seen by security cameras, if witnesses see you kill people and you don't do anything about it, then the next level you play is going to be, um, the AI is going to be affected by this, so which means that if your notoriety is skyrocketing, next time you, the next level you're going to play, people are just going to run away screaming from you. And the way to remedy this, of course, is to bribe off people, and in the extreme consequence, it's to buy a new identity. So, even though we, we did a lot of effort to make the game fun when you go, you know, go shooting and play it as a shooter, the backside of doing that is that all the money you're going to make, you will almost be forced to spend on you know fixing all the trails that you leave behind and this whole thing is going to be visualized for the player with a newspaper article that describes the whole scenario like say you do it stealthy it could be accident kills uh, i don't know chic and uh, you know we have no clue why or whatever from that to psycho killer goes rampaging through casino for example we have some really major enhancements in the game the first one is that you can fly in space. You got space combat in Battlefront 2. It's all new to Star Wars Battlefront 2. These really massive, uh, immersive space battles. You can dogfight, you can take over capital ships. You can actually fly a TIE fighter into a rebel frigate, land, get out, and start shooting rebels. That TIE fighter pilot can jump into an X-Wing if he wants. He just, you know, and so now he's flying around in an X-Wing, uh, blowing away in, in, uh, rebel ships with their own ship. The other major thing that we're adding is Jedi. 
She's not available in the first game, in the first game. but now in Star Wars Battlefront 2, you've got Jedi characters, and they're fully integrated into single player and multiplayer as well. So Jedi are a major faction. We've got a lot of hero characters. We're not announcing all of them just yet, but we are showing Obi-Wan here at the show. This is our Obi-Wan Kenobi model. It's based on Ewan McGregor's performance. He's the young Obi-Wan. General Grievous is also in Episode 3, uh, Darth Vader, of course. Yeah, I mean, we're, we're definitely using uh, hero characters that people are going to be very familiar with from the films. You are uh, Ethan Thomas, who's uh, an FBI detective. Uh, you've been essentially framed for a crime that you didn't commit by a serial killer. So you hate it when that happens. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a rough gig. It happened to me like three times last year. Just today, twice. Yeah, the paperwork is immense. So when can we expect Condemned? We're not exactly sure when, when Microsoft is going to launch the console, but we will be available in the Xbox 360 launch window. So my name is Chris Evenden, I'm director of PR at ATI. One of the things we want to talk about at the show today is Xbox 360. Uh, you may or may not know that ATI co-designed the graphics processor for uh, 360, and it's something we're immensely proud of. It contains a number of innovations that you're not going to see this year on PC. You'll see one or two of them maybe next year. Some of them you'll never see on PC graphics at all. It's an incredibly powerful and versatile graphics processor. And we've got it here running live content, and I can talk you through the live content. This is not a tape loop. This is something that's being rendered live. It's actually a demo for our next generation PC content that we decided at the last minute we'd try and port across to Xbox, and we used their XNA uh, tools to port it across. We got it across in less than a week, which really speaks to the programmability of the Xbox as well. And you've got it here running. It's not even fully flexing anything like the full capabilities of the graphics processor inside. So you see here something looking absolutely amazing. Yeah, there's a lot of detail, a lot going on, even getting the skin right on Ruby. The three things I think that we're most proud of in the architecture, firstly we have this thing called an adaptive shader array, and this is um, a unified shader architecture. Again, this is something you'll see come to PCs probably at the end of next year, and you're going to get it this year on the 360, and uh, incredibly flexible, uh, very versatile, very powerful. The developer doesn't have to worry about whether there's a lot of geometry going on in the scene or whether there's a lot of special effects, it just right, it balances it all on the fly. Very, very powerful. 48 shader engines. Um, 100 and no, 240 shader operations per clock. Very powerful. Second thing we've got in there is a modeling engine. This is really a tool for tomorrow. This has a lot of incredible features um, that game developers aren't even using yet. It's something that you'll see discussed in papers at uh, conferences like SIGGRAPH. Uh, global illumination, for example, is one technique that the industry agrees is the way forward for lighting scenes. Uh, we can do it on this. We can do it on this chip this year. Uh, no other console can give you that. The final feature that we're immensely proud of is we've got this intelligent memory actually embedded in the graphics processor. It's like we've extended the graphics pipeline right into the local memory, and that allows us to do. This is absolutely essential for high definition gaming. Allows us to do things like um, anti-aliasing, essentially for free. There's no performance here. For, for XAA, something that's absolutely essential for high definition gaming where you can see every pixel on the screen. You could get away with it before on standard definition TVs, you can't get away with it now. Uh, it also allows you to do very, very fast stencil calculations, which are immensely important for shadows, dynamic shadows and everything. And um, it also allows you to do blending for special effects, explosions, that sort of thing. So overall, you've got an incredibly powerful engine that gives you uh, uh, fluid reality, like natural motion, great special effects. Uh, years ahead of anything you'll see anywhere else. It's like next year, next, are you getting it this year? I'm Itagaki of Team Ninja. Well, this year at E3, uh, Xenon, well, it's not Xenon anymore, it's uh, Xbox 360. The uh, DOA 4, you know, has been the big talk of town and uh, people are excited about it and I'm excited about it. Well, uh, Xbox 360 uh, allows me to uh, uh, turn my vision in my head onto a TV screen. And, uh, you know, for instance, like the use of camera, uh, what we call spider, spider cam, where the camera, you know, drops from the sky and follows, you know, downwards. Uh, such things, you know, uh, were, you know, made, a, uh, were made possible. Um, it just, you know, excites me to, to know that now I can, can do all these things. This isn't just a head-to-head -head fighter anymore. We take them all the time, we put them in the action adventure world. So now you don't just have your one-to-one uh, -one fight, you can fight multiple ends at one time. 
The game is based around Mortal Kombat 2, so every character from MK2 is in the game somewhere. The story is based around MK2, and all the backgrounds of MK2 are actually levels in this game. We've got lots of new titles coming up. Nintendogs is the, one of the big titles for us this year. We've got Animal Crossing DS, Mario Kart DS, Metroid Prime Hunters. Lots of good stuff for people to see this year. Let's talk about the wireless experience. Right, yes, the Nintendo Wi-Fi connection is our brand new online network. It's going to be easy for people to use, and the first few games that we're going to use it are Animal Crossing DS and Mario Kart DS. What are some of the cool features that Mario Kart can do on the DS that can't do anywhere else? The best way to describe it is it's a Mario Kart fan's dream game. I mean, it basically takes tracks from dating all the way back to the Super NES game and adds on top of that brand new tracks. The DS version has you know, online multiplayer capability with using our new network, the Nintendo Wi-Fi connection. It's also got a touchscreen capability where you can change between the map and the current standing. Well, you know, the only way to describe Nintendo is, is it's a puppy inside your DS. It thinks like a puppy, it acts like a puppy, you can play with it like a puppy. It's really quite amazing. Come on! You know, people have been playing Zelda games for, you know, as long as they can remember. And, you know, the Zelda series has a lot of history with people. And I think this game is really going to blow people away. Tell me about some of the storyline. Well, you know, some of the storyline is still secret, but the action is incredible. You know, one of the things I'm going to show you here is actually uh, Link riding on a horse and cutting down enemies. It's really pretty incredible. The all-new graphical look to this game is really a departure from the, you know, Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker. Uh, you know, it's a realistic graphic style, some more mature Link. Uh, it's got an edgier look to it, and I think fans are really going to think it's pretty amazing. At our presentation here, I think we were able to show a lot of a lot of content, so that was good. Um, right now in Japan, we are engaged in the, uh, a lot of DS challenges, trying to, 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 to do a lot of new things with that, and I think we were able to show you the results of, of, of what we've been doing with the DS. Mario Brothers, which allows uh, you know, to get two people side-scrolling, uh, and uh, but they're actually uh, are even side-scrolling at the same time on different systems. Animal Crossing um, on the DS, you have the wireless functionality there of having you know four people um, playing at the same time there. Mario Kart, of course, you get you know, eight people racing at the same time. So these are all um, games that were that are really utilizing good uh, DS functionality. And there's one other. A game that I'd like to talk about there. Yeah, and that we think we, it appeals to players of all ages. Uh, um, something you can pick up right away. It's easy to get into. Uh, might not qualify as a game per se. And, and, and one of those titles that fits that criterion is what we showed you yesterday, and that's Nintendo Dogs. Another program, or excuse me, a software that falls under that, uh, again, that blanket of description is Electroplankton. And we're also looking at creating more of this sort of software in Japan. And one I've got here that I'm showing you now is one that's a, sort of a brain teaser, brain exercise software. We use the, you know, the touch screen to write, out, uh, to write out answers to problems that the game will pose to you. Um, we use the voice recognition system to answer verbally questions or to record uh, sounds and whatnot. These things all represent to us the possibilities of, of having people that are obvi obviously can play games, and the, but those who don't play games as well. I don't think anyone who would play this maybe they're not uh, you know, they're not a gamer per se, but they're still going to enjoy this type of software. Evolution, of course, is the next generation. No, as far as the revolution is concerned, obviously we there it's under development. It's going really well, and uh, we want to give out some of the general concepts. We're going to save everything else for when we're all set. And, and next year, when it's the year of the revolution, rather than this year, that's when we'll bring out everything uh, from under, under the wrapping paper. No, um, I, I didn't get a chance to see the Sony and Microsoft presentations myself, but from what I've heard from people, I mean, it sounds like, obviously, they're going to be using cutting-edge cutting technology, as, as are we. Um, however, the way that they are planning on implementing that technology it's obviously very different from the, from the route that we're going to do. For, for myself, as, you know, as on the business end of things, I see where they're going, and I see where we're going, and I, I'm not worried at all. I think uh, it's not going to influence us at all. We're, we're, we're good to go. And the way we're approaching the development of the revolution um, is we, we pose the question to ourselves, why is a home console necessary? What functions in a home console would make everyone in the family say, yeah, we need that, yeah, we want that? We pose that question and the answers to that question as we've 
uh, Dell, or as, as we have answered them, are, are what's driving our development. In regards to Mario 128, there are currently we're doing lots of Mario experiments uh, back in Kyoto. And um, we are definitely going to have a new Mario 4 in the revolution. Whether or not that's 128 or, or not, I, you know, I can't really say. You know, it might be a new sunshine. We're not sure. We're doing a lot of Mario tests right now for the revolution. In regards to the, the power of the, the Nintendo Revolution versus, say, the Xbox 360, we're, we're looking at making a small, quiet, affordable console. If you look at trying to incorporate all of that, of course, we're, we, we might not uh, have, have the horsepower that maybe some other companies have. But, you know, if you look at the numbers that they're throwing out, are those numbers going to be used in the game? Are they actually using those? I mean, those are just numbers that somebody crunched up on a calculator. And, you know, we could throw out a bunch of numbers too, but what we're going to do is we're going to wait till our chips are done, everything's you know, in the game, we're going to find out how it's running, what its peak performance is, and those are the numbers that we're going to release. Because those are, the, those are the only numbers that really count. I do think it's very um, irresponsible for people to say, this is what we're running at, this is the power of our machine, when they're not even running on final boards. So I think the professional's job is to not believe those numbers. Yeah. Well, yeah, I don't think we're going to alienate gamers at all. I think if you look at the stuff that we have on the Nintendo DS, which is different from anything else out there, people are playing that and really enjoying that. They're going to be, there's going to be software on the Revolution that you will not be able to play or experience anywhere else on any other console, you know, at any other time. And I think people will find it enjoyable. I mean, E3 version. I don't know. I want to see Killzone 2. I want to look at all the cell phone games, especially uh, John Madden. I, I want to see what that's like on the phone. Waiting to be surprised. 360. Uh, I don't know. I was looking to see the. Uh, New Enemy Territories game, Quake Wars. I'm excited to see Fatality. I fired up the 3D games on mobile. Um, well, I'm very excited about looking at what Nintendo's doing with the DS, and games for the DS, and uh, there's just so much new coming this year, and, and I think a lot of the games coming out in the fall are just very exciting, like Animal Crossing DS. Excited to see uh, Perfect Dark Zero Killzone. It's the original Nintendo with Mega Man, Kid Icarus, Donkey Kong, Princess. Absolutely everything. I'm excited to see the new uh, Xbox 360 and sweet new games they got off of that. King Hippo from Mike Tyson's Punch Out. Age of Empires 2. I'm excited to see anything on the PS3. Still have a lot of work to do on it, but. Yeah, well, you got a lot of leg left. So you'll be back to that. <laughs> I'm, try I'm, tr I'm trying to get fatter so I can put more on there. So. <laughs> I'm excited about the 360. Anything related to the PS3, Unreal Engine 3. Xbox 360. Uh, the Zelda game. I'm a Nintendo fangirl, so I'm very excited about the Nintendo game. I got to see some of the Zelda game yesterday, and oh, it's beautiful. I'm very excited to see the new Xbox. PS3. EverQuest 2. Also very excited about uh, about the Xbox, the next Xbox 360, naturally. I'm excited about all of it. <laughs> awesome. Good answer. <laughs>